Now, does Canada care more about the environment than the U.S. does? Uh, here on View from the North, uh, and this is uh, Dr. Ken Rogers, retired Canadian businessman, and we're going to talk about the, you know, the view from the North about the environment and the view from the South about the environment. And before the show began, we were talking about, uh, you know, this remarkable experience uh, that Ken and I had uh, oh, oh, um, back uh, oh, oh, 45 years ago, maybe, um, which was uh, in, the, uh, in the mountains, in the Rocky Mountains, uh, in, I guess, British Columbia or uh, Alberta, where he took me to the Continental Divide, uh, where you can see a stream, and the stream is going in two directions. It's going east and west. And I, you know, I didn't understand that. I didn't know about it. And he said, notice, notice, Fidel. Notice it goes both ways. This, if you didn't notice, this is the continental divide. It's holy, holy. I mean, I thought it was a line on a map. Oh, no, 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 no. Then it was really very beautiful. But the other thing I wanted to mention before we begin our conversation in earnest um, is, a, is a program, it's a series on uh, Netflix called um, Alone. And uh, Alone is a, it's a contest. Uh, it's a documentary covering these people who enter into this contest with big stakes, you know, a lot of money if you win. Now you, have, you have to stay out in the wild for like 100 days through the, through the winter season alone with very limited you know, provisions and tools. Um, and a camera, actually a couple of cameras, where they take pictures of themselves and a radio that reports back when they need to, quote, tap out. Tapping out means I give up, I can't stand it anymore. You, you know, come with a helicopter and take me away, take me back. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of them do tap out because they can't stand the weather. They can't stand the, the struggle of survival in, in the complete wilderness. But one thing about this show, which is so captivating, is, is the environment. I mean, there are, yes, there are places in the world that are completely isolated and beautiful beyond description, beautiful. In very, this is not only in Canada, it's in various places, um, and they're all alone. And there are maybe 10 or 12 of them at a given time. And uh, the guys who put this together do a great job in showing you about you know, the primitive, the wild, which still exists. And, and in large part, I mentioned it because in large part, um, you can find places like that in Canada right now today. I know you could find a place like that, Ken. It wouldn't be too far from your home, would it? Uh, that's correct. I mean, you, you've got to take into account that, um, you know, Canada is the second largest country in area in the world. And, uh, and a good percentage of it is about as useful as most of Alaska. You know, what, do mean, what do you mean useful? That's, that's, that, that deserves some definition. Well, useful or useless or pretty empty. Um, you know, you have some parts that, uh, you know, there are no people, for example, not too far from from north of Vancouver, uh, sort of halfway between Vancouver and where the Alaska Panhandle, uh, the southern part of the Alaska Panhandle is is uh, a huge part of British Columbia called the Great Bear Rainforest. You know, you may have seen documentaries where there are white, white bears, you know, and, uh, you know, that created good uh, native folklore. And, and that's why they call it the Great Bear Rainforest. Uh, you know, it's also, uh, you know, wonderful uh, country for fishing you know, hunting, if you, if they allowed it now, it's uh, <laughs> almost like a mega sized reserve. But, um, you know, you, you have this wilderness all over Canada. But when you talked about somebody camping out overnight, you know, if, if you were camping out, uh, you know, um, you can go, you know, 30 miles from Vancouver, and you're in the absolute wilderness. Uh, even though Vancouver's got nearly three million people in the metro area, uh, but uh, but you could camp out there quite nicely. Whereas if you went, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
30 miles north of Winnipeg and tried it in the middle of winter, you'd have a very different problem. It's much like uh, Minneapolis and Seattle are at the same um, latitude, but uh, you know, experience in the winter in Seattle is pretty comfortable and Minneapolis is pretty miserable. Hmm. Well, I mean, I always felt that uh, you, you're my exemplar of a Canadian, um, that you had a special feeling about the environment. Um, that you were not afraid to go into it, that you appreciated it, uh, that you related to it. Uh, anybody living, you know, reasonably close in this very large country, this country with such a, you know, a, a spectacular uh, wilderness, um, would would have a certain connection with it, an appreciate appreciation of it, perhaps more than Americans did or do now. Am I right about that? Um. Yes and no. Uh, if you were to ask the average Canadian on the street, they think that uh, Canada has a wonderful uh, policy uh, to try to strive to get, uh, you know, uh, control of the uh, changing climate, uh, to get our greenhouse gas emissions down, etc. And that, uh, you know, the, uh, the public relations uh, put out by the the various levels of government in Canada have certainly brainwashed the majority of the Canadian public. The, the public in their stomach really is, uh, uh, you know, strong advocates that climate change exists and something major should be done about it. But I was uh, uh, looking at a, uh, a thing called the Climate Change Performance Index, a, a European um, group uh, puts out this index every uh, every year, and they rank uh, a, a whole bunch of countries. And uh, and this year they rank 64 countries in terms of their um, climate change performance. How are they doing compared to the Paris Agreement targets, etc.? Well, the, out of 64 countries, uh, Canada was ranked by them 61st. Oh. Oh, I mean, almost the end. And and the United States was ranked only a teeny bit better. They were at 55th, you know, <laughs> so that, you know, the two of us are at the bottom of the bucket. And for example, uh, they did it under four categories. And uh, and they, they kind of have uh, very low, uh, very, very low, uh, you know, are the two worst categories. And that's where Canada ranked on everything. They had, uh, uh, we ranked at the um, very low uh, in greenhouse gas emissions, renewable energy, and energy use. And the only one we ranked a little better, we just ranked low on the climate policy. Now, if you read the Canada's official climate policy, you'd you'd just say, "Wow, do these people ever have their act together? They just don't follow through." You know, they, yeah. they uh, and um, much of it in Canada is uh, the relationship between the federal government and the provincial governments. Um, the federal government has all the money. Like they have all the taxing power relatively, like the provinces have some, but the federal government really has an abundance of funds and the provincial governments have most of the responsibilities or the provincial governments and the municipal governments. So that you have a thing like healthcare and you get a federal government establishing a standard and then as the costs of health care increase, the federal government doesn't increase the amount of money they put in, you know, so that the health care system starts to suffer. Like we've got a major suffering now in that regard. But with regard to, to climate change, um, the majority of the population in Canada, you know, is, is in, let's call it, north of Ohio. <laughs> you know, or next door to Michigan, you know, Southern Ontario and, mm -hmm. and Quebec, you know, have uh, about 60% uh, of Canada's population, where um, 
you know, most of the resources that it, involving energy and, and none of those come from those two provinces. So when you're sitting with climate change, you can't separate energy and the production of energy from uh, the climate change policy. So that Canada has this wonderful looking policy produced by the federal government, but they leave the responsibility to, you know, the three big energy provinces to deliver. You know, that, let's see, that, that'd be British Columbia. Um, Alberta and which was the oh, third? Oh, actually, it's not British Columbia. Um, it's actually Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland. Ah, ah. Uh, British Columbia has a ton of natural gas. They have enough natural gas that could probably supply Europe for for a lot of years, but there's no pipeline. Right, and you'd have to go through the Panama Canal or something to get it over there. Well, you, no, you got to get it from, you know, northeast British Columbia. You got to get it to a coast first. Oh, well, cheer up. Everything uh, toward the Arctic is melting anyway, so it'll be easier and easier. <clears throat> if the Russians let us pass, you know, uh, <clears throat> that's another show. But let me let me uh, let me ask you about the Western provinces. I mean, they are heavily invested in oil and gas, uh, and that's always been the case. And uh, it's a big part of the economy, isn't it? And a lot of people are employed in oil and gas. And and their general view of the matter is, uh, hey, we we do oil and gas. Don't bother us with clean energy. Uh, we're we're dedicated to oil and gas, and and uh, we, okay. we don't we don't buy we don't buy the same. Um, you know, climate change approach that the East does. Am I right? No, no, you're not correct. Um, I love when you tell me I'm wrong. Well, <laughs> uh, you're just wrong a little bit, let's say. <laughs> okay. Um, that uh, the province of Alberta, which is the biggest energy producer, uh, and it's the one that, that makes Canada, you know, a, a mega, you know, on a world stage, the fourth biggest oil producing country in the world um, and most of it comes from Alberta you know or Alberta and Saskatchewan but um, <clears throat> Alberta was the first place to have a, uh, a price on carbon first place in North America um, mm -hmm. you know that Alberta has um, uh, let's say the difficulty with the uh, oil sands is that when you're mining the oil, like some of it is really just open pit mining. You, it's like you bring in a big shovel and you dig up uh, uh, sand that's, uh, that's got oil. Uh, you know, it's oil and sand mixed together. That's the Athabasca tar sands, isn't it? Well, they would like you to say the oil sands. Okay. <laughs> but um, because, uh, you know, but you know, if if in Hawaii you want to improve your infrastructure and you want to pave a road, well, where where do you get the asphalt? Yeah, you know, like not, like, not, not like, here. <laughs> and so, you know, on a world scale, you'd say, well, who are the most terrible countries for you know climate uh, uh, their climate policy or climate result? Uh, you know, how are they doing for, uh, you know, total greenhouse gas release? Well, if you take any country where the amount of oil and gas production they have is large compared to their population, you know, which in Canada's case is there. Well, actually, if you took uh, the five biggest oil producers in the world and you just say, well, the United States is the only one with an awful lot of population compared to what they're producing. And the other four look like they're the laggards in the world, uh, world's effort to solve climate change. You know, and, and similarly, like the province of Saskatchewan in Canada is, is probably in the most difficult spot to handle for uh, or to resolve climate change problems because their biggest industry is is fertilizer like potash 
and potash mining, uh, you know, and potash itself, you, you have nitrous oxide. Well, it's a greenhouse gas that makes CO2 look like it's, uh, you know, an ice cream cone. You know, that, uh, you know, there's, it's just so potent as a greenhouse gas that it's, it's kind of almost impossible to develop fertilizer without having a problem. But what I, what I get is that these, these provinces are particularly interested in the economics um, of you know, providing potash or oil or gas. And they're not too interested in following these wonderful policies that have been, um, you know, written in Ottawa. Um, no, no. Uh, on the contrary, they're they're standing on their head to to uh, achieve the policies um, that that they believe is are appropriate, and their policies often are more stringent than some of the federal ones. But um, that cuts know, like, against them. It cuts against their interests, doesn't it? Well, it's just tough to make the total target. You know, like like if you're if you're in you know Saskatchewan, which only it has less than a million and a half people, but it's got a huge white mining industry and a, and a huge oil and gas industry, even even though it's smaller than Alberta, and and it's you know and the rest of their GDP relates to agriculture, like it's. It's as good as Ukraine or Southern Russia, or maybe even better, because you can have, um, uh, you know, um, dry land farming works like like crazy in in Saskatchewan and and Alberta and Manitoba. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's sort of the breadbasket for you know production of wheat and things like that, where you don't need um, irrigation, you don't need anything, you just plant it and it grows. <laughs> Um, okay, so you have good sure. policies. Um, may, maybe uh, on this rating schedule you mentioned, maybe not as uh, effectively uh, as the U.S., but but close in terms of you know ef- efficacy or not so efficacious. But um, the, I guess that, you know to me there are a few things that enter into that calculation. Number one is the quality of the policy itself, whether it's you know. Um, what do you want to call it? Conceptually, conceptually visionary or not. Two is um, um, uh, whether you're taking the steps and contributing to the world funding through the United Nations and COP27 and the like um, to deal with climate change, protect, preserve the environment um, around the world. Uh, and uh, you know, with the notion being, as came up in COP27, that the more Successful countries, um, uh, the the countries that have provided the gas and oil and and uh, contributed to climate change should should fund the problems that are being experienced in the other ones like extreme weather because it's not it's not equal uh, and to achieve some sort you'll of ne- you'll never ever get the countries to agree on that because it it would become an open ended liability it's it's like uh, you know, pick a couple of racial ones in Canada versus the the natives, or in the United States versus the blacks. How much should every state pay uh, for you know the harm done to the blacks uh, two hundred years ago? You know, and and, 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 and nobody's going to agree to to that as an open ended item because. And and that's really the the climate change question in these third world countries is is you know the United States and Canada and and other wealthy countries might make significant contributions but they sure do not wish to in any way agree that they are liable for something you yeah. know and, and and your climate change problem you know is is so different from one country to another. For example, most of Europe uh, looks like they're one doing wonderfully well, you know, well, but then you take Poland, you know, and, and Poland ranks about the same as Canada and the United States on most uh, 
things like that index I referred to a few minutes ago. But but Poland has, uh, how do they produce their electricity? From coal. How do they heat everything in the country? From coal. Are they a nice, warm, cozy country like, you know, uh, you know, Florida? The answer is no. They have a terribly cold winter. And so they, you know, how do they then have no greenhouse gas production? Well, if you don't have a bunch of other industries that exist uh, that can bridge you to substitute from coal to something else, you're just SOL. So uh, other countries, I'm thinking of sub-Saharan Africa and all that, they have a real problem because the extreme weather, the drought, the, the floods, all this, it disrupts their society. And you know they can't get a handle on, on stability, democracy, what have you, even you know, developing an economy um, because, because of the, the weather and the extreme weather. And so it would be better on a global basis if somehow we could equalize the burden. Uh, the United Nations is ineffective in doing this. I don't, I don't know what the solution is, but I, don't you agree that it would be better for all of us if we could find a way to equalize the effect of climate change, whether it's contributing money, whether it's uh, you know, getting less of a return on investing into a fossil fuel, um, whether it's um, um, using technologies that we're still developing that, that are ac actually not deployed yet, but will be, whether it's geo, uh, geo, the geo approach where you salt the clouds, right? And you change the weather by uh, affecting the geophysics um, of, of the area. I mean, this is, this is a big discussion now. And there's a, an essential injustice in that because no, none of the scientists know exactly what effect it has if you salt the clouds in one place as to what happens in another place. You could be doing very destructive things if you don't know enough about it. But my point is, isn't it better to have this, uh, this kind of equalization? It would be better, but you know, even though I might think of uh, climate change as, as the biggest problem for North America. But you mentioned, you know, uh, the rest of the world. Well, their biggest problem is stop having wars. <laughs> I, I mean, it, let, let's pretend that, uh, that you and I are in charge of uh, handling, uh, you know, climate mitigation policies. Uh, uh, where in Africa can you go that it's uh, worth even trying to get there to set up camp because you know if if you look like you've got five cents in your pocket you might be kidnapped and held for ransom by some yin yangy group same same thing in latin america well and, and you've uh, got a slug of asia with that uh, same problem like like you've got uh, myanmar or what used to be called burma you know that's atrocious stuff well, I, you know, uh, yes, you're right. And it's a chicken and egg problem because if you have a society that, that can't uh, develop a stable government, can't develop public safety, can't develop uh, an economy, it, it's more likely that, that you're going to have uh, incidents like that and risks and dangers to anyone who, who tries to fix it. Um, and uh, so, you, uh, so it, it makes it more difficult. And then as a result, people don't want to come in and fix it and it perpetuates. Um, I don't know where you start, you know, tacking this down, but it seems to me that um, dealing with climate change has a benefit. I mean, a lot of these countries have given Europe uh, millions of migrants because of the droughts and the floods and the extreme weather in sub-Saharan Africa uh, and all of Africa, really. And so, you know, the, the question is, um, wouldn't it be better if we at least started tacking it down in that regard, and we gave them better energy, for example, cleaner, cheaper energy, and if we also gave them better weather, so that you know it didn't have these aberrations in weather, unpredictable. Well, you you say give them better 
weather. I, I don't think that you can give them better weather. You can perhaps start taking measures so that it'll stop going downhill. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, most of Africa has, has really nice weather. Yeah, I suppose. But, uh, I mean, if you're you can make a nice it, vacation over there. If you're uh, comparing it to Mongolia or Siberia or, or you know, most of Alaska. If you have drought and you can't eat, it's a problem. And you tend to look, uh, look elsewhere um, to live. Well, Climate, climate change and, and feeding the world go together the same as uh, energy. I mean, totally. the, the big yeah. problem with, uh, with all of the climate change stuff is, is basically you say the end result would be you have electrification of the world. You know, you produce everything that is run to a great extent with electricity. Now, how do you produce the electricity without any greenhouse gases? You know, and you have measures to suck the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Um, you know, well, you're really dealing with um, the need to produce an awful lot more electricity than we have now. Now, if you take all these countries that are growing, just take China alone, or better still, take China and India together, you know, being probably a third of the world's population between the two of them, and they have phenomenal growth rates. You know, they're the now, if their standard of living continues to rise, you know, let's just say if you took India alone and moved it up to the standard of living that China's now at, you know, in GDP how much additional electricity does the world need to produce? Right. And what are the side effects? Mm, yeah. The detriments of all that. So I guess, I guess what I'm asking is, um, you know, where, where do the, where does the average Canadian stand? Where does the average province stand? Where does the average Canadian company stand, including multinationals uh, on those issues, as opposed to the U S are you, I mean, the index is, of course, one factor, but um, is the Canadian view of it more constructive, more helpful, or less, or is it the same? Do, you know, do we share the same, you know, ethic? Do we share the same efficacy in dealing with this, you know, in, in adapting to it, in, in working on avoiding greenhouse gases, uh, and, of course, in the technology? Well, as a generalization, uh, Canadian, individual Canadians and individual Americans are really, really similar in their attitude. Um, the biggest difference between uh, the two is in the U.S., you've got a more extreme um, right-wing side. Uh, you just have more, let's call it climate denier equivalent than we do. You know, any um, uh, stupidity to that extreme that you have in the U.S., we have some, but just not as much. Um, that, uh, you know, Canadians are far more uh, willing to accept uh, if the government uh, concludes something, bring in a policy, they'll adjust to it. You know, if you know, if they're going to, you know, if you invent a new traffic light called a purple light, whatever it is, you know, red light, green light, Canadians will do what you're supposed to do for a purple light. You know, Americans might say, you know, start a big portion would be jumping up and down saying you're violating my right to carry a gun. <laughs> because, you know, purple lights affect how I can carry it or something. Um, now, in, in everything to do with climate change, you know, that applies. But one advantage the U.S. has is, is the sheer scale of your corporations and your governments. You know, the U.S. has several research government 
financed research facilities around the country that deal with all kinds of oil and gas matters. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly, the corporations, you know, um, if, it, if it's economic to produce electricity with solar power, the corporations will get out there and do it. You know, and in some states, you know, usually California leads on most good things that happen in the U.S., in my opinion, or, you know, California, Washington, and Oregon certainly seem to be uh, the most Canadian-ish Canadian, Canadian in, in their attitude towards, you know, things like, you know, bringing in rules that uh, will help things like climate change. Uh, however, <clears throat> uh, overall, those big U.S. corporations, you know, will generally do research on their own, where the Canadian corporations just aren't that big, so we can't do uh, as much. Um, now, you get things like minor changes in policies, like the province of Alberta with their oil and gas, um, you know, was um, trying to encourage a lot of what I call the right thing. Well, um, Alberta oil was um, probably, uh, you know, 15 years ago was um, uh, oh, half American companies. Well, you know, as Canada moved to, you know, more policies trying to deal with climate change. Uh, most of those American companies said, we don't want to deal with those rules. We'll, you know, move all our exploration activities into the U.S. Oh, how interesting. Um, you know, and, and uh, now, so that we've now narrowed down and there's only a half a dozen companies are producing 5 million barrels a day in Canada. I mean, the, you know, um, subsidiary of Exxon is still there. Imperial Oil is one of them, but uh, most of the rest have left town. Mm. I mean, even some of the Canadian companies have, you know, we used to have a, a monstrous company called Incana, and it was split and uh, half moved to the states and half stayed in Canada. <laughs> very, very interesting. It leads me to my last question to you, Ken. And that is, you know, looking at the younger generation, <laughs> the ones coming out of high school and college, how do they feel about this? Uh, can we count on them to continue bearing the torch on climate change and fossil fuels and all that, uh, you know, effectuating these policies uh, or are they going to say ho hum about it? Well, in Canada, you know, the young people that I've encountered are more raw raw about climate change than than uh, the uh, their parents. Um, you know, it tends to be the oldest of people, like let's call it the seniors, and the young kids seem to be the ones that are raw raw for you know climate change policies. You know, it's the working age adults that, you know, are, are less gung-ho. So then it's fair to say that there'll be more, what do you want to call it, political public pressure on the subject in the next five or ten years? Oh, yeah. The pressure is on now. Uh, you know, Canada is, and the U.S. have been real laggards in, uh, you know, moving towards the Paris uh, uh, levels. But both countries have really accelerated what they're doing lately. I mean, in the U.S., you could blame it on the the Trump era to a great extent, um, you know. But, uh, you know, in Canada, you know, it's really, you know, lack of the federal government financing things. Uh, for example, uh, you know, in northern Alberta, or let's call it right near Edmonton, uh, you know, there's a, a four billion dollar plant that's just, you know, starting construction for development of hydrogen. You know, and there's a second 
plant of about I think it's 1.8 billion for hydrogen. Um, you know those. Um, uh, you know that's not chicken feed. That's that's no. mega scale uh, operations. Um, you know that you've got. Um, you know in um, just north of the what I call that Great Bear Rainforest on the coast of British Columbia, uh, a little bit south of the Alaska Pan, the bottom of the Alaska Panhandle. You know is is the world's most efficient aluminum smelter. You know, well, aluminum production, you know, where aluminum is really a, a useful product, but it's a great contributor to greenhouse gases. Well, the, the world's most efficient plant is is there in, in British Columbia in a place called Kitimat, um, where, you know, they have a fantastic way of producing electricity uh, uh, that that made that so inexpensive it's it's really a nifty deal so that you know american and canadian companies are at the forefront in in a lot of the de technological developments uh it's just the the europeans started uh you know solar and wind before uh, we got around to it and you know if you think of the joe mansions of the world saying well we've got these coal mines and we've got people working them and and why don't we let them work that out for the next 20 years or something where the europeans were saying no no let's close them all down yeah well it's going to be more motivation with more bad weather more droughts more floods more what have you and uh more pressure on both countries I'm 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 really glad to find that um, you know the, these technologies are happening because they're they're an example of what can be done. Um, it's not like you can turn the whole society up upside down one day and deal with climate change that way. You have to bring technology in and make things more efficient, little by little. Um, you know, work out, minimize uh, the risk of uh, fossil fuel. Ken, yeah. we got to go. Um, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. I always enjoy the, your flexibility, if you will, and good nature. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks. We'll find something else. I'm thinking of the arts uh, and music in Canada, if you like. Uh, and after that, I would like to spend a show with you on, on starting a business in Canada and how that might differ from starting a business in the U.S. Okay. Ken Rogers, retired Canadian businessman, always so nice. Take care, be well, don't be cold. All right. Bye for now. Aloha. <laughs>